to hear tonight, the next mayor of Duluth, Roger Reinert. Well, thank you, Brianna. Um, and how, how are we on volume? Let's just do the mic check right away. Good? Up. Oh, hey, Ryan. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are those thumbs? No, those are turn it up. So, how about now? Whoa. The front people are like too much. But in the back, uh, like Brianna said, please make yourself comfortable. Um, we're going to walk through a few issues tonight. Um, you know, the beginning of the campaign has been all about um, a lot of me just listening and asking questions and folks have wanted to hear more and so this is a perfect time, uh, especially with uh, one candidate's perspective last night to share um, some thoughts with all of you. So please make yourself comfortable, have a beverage, find a chair, use the bathrooms. Um, like I teach college uh, at Scholastica, just just do what you need to do. It's okay. Uh, so I want to begin tonight by telling you a little bit about the Stockdale paradox. Admiral James Stockdale was a naval aviator who flew over 200 combat missions during three tours in Vietnam. On September 9th, 1965, his A4 Skyhawk was shot down. He was captured and became the highest ranking United States military officer in the Hanoi Hilton during the height of the Vietnam War. Tortured over 20 times during his eight year imprisonment, Stockdale lived out the war without any prisoner rights, no set release date and no certainty about whether he would even survive to see his family again. When asked how he made it alive when others didn't, Stockdale said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event of my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. He was then asked, well, who didn't make it out? Oh, that's easy, he said, the optimists. Oh, they were the ones who said, we're gonna be out by Christmas and Christmas would come and go. Then they'd say we're gonna be out by Easter and Easter would come and go. And then Thanksgiving and then it would be Christmas again and they died of a broken heart. He went on to say, this is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you cannot afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. This approach articulated so well has, become, has come to be known as the Stockdale Paradox, or the idea that productive change begins when you confront the brutal facts of your present circumstances. My friends, we will talk about productive change tonight. We will be excited about the potential for Duluth's next chapter, but we will also confront the cold reality of our present circumstances. We must. To do otherwise is to ask all of you to ignore what you see on a daily basis living in our community. Last night we had one candidate's assessment of the state of our city. Tonight you will get another. And to every other candidate that is out there, those still thinking about it, I invite you and hope that you will do the same. Take this opportunity to share with us your assessment and your vision. This conversation we are having about our community within the context of the 2023 election is one of the most important I can recall. And my gosh, I hope that that will be represented in voter turnout in November. In 2019, we had 38% voter turnout in Duluth, Minnesota. I find that embarrassing. Duluth, we need to do better. To not vote is to vote for the status quo, to continue the path that we are already on. Now the reason you have seen me engage you through conversation and not through activities like a good sauna or throwing a rock down a, um, the curling ice is that I feel like this would convey a sense that all is well, that things are great, that we have no serious concerns. 
And that's just not how I see our community right now. And to be honest, it's not how you do either. I know because you have told me. As of two Fridays ago, we've had over 100 conversations since we began our campaign, mostly one-on-one, -on -one, some small group. And I have heard consistent themes of concern. And those concerns are valid. During this campaign, we have and we will continue to give you space to share your concerns, to give you voice for those concerns, to bring those concerns to the public table, and to discuss potential solutions. My friends, this is not pandering. This is good leadership. A good leader gets down to the neck deck plates. For my Navy friends, sorry for my Army and Air Force friends, you get down to the deck plates. You take in all the information and the viewpoints that you can. And then a good leader tries to assemble that information and articulate it as best they can so that we can have a meaningful community conversation. I heard last night that the state of our city is strong and growing stronger. Duluth, that is not what you are telling me or what you are sharing with each other. My friends, the state of our city is serious. So I thank you for sitting with me, sharing with me, and I ask that you continue to do that over the next eight months. Talk with me, tell me what is on your heart, what is on your mind. I will listen. If you've met with me, you know that I will ask questions. I will take notes, and together we will talk about solutions. You might get a different impression tonight, but I'm actually not a big talker. I'm a doer. And while I will go into a few issues with some depth this evening, and these are the ones that you have consistently said in the last two and a half months, top your list, you are unlikely willing to sit long enough for me to touch on everything that you've shared with me so far. For those of you that are able, I, please, I invite you to please hang out afterwards for a beverage and more conversation. I will get rid of the jacket, I will get rid of the tie, and I will talk to as many folks as possible. You can tell me what you hated, you can tell me what you liked, um, and I will answer as many questions and answer as honestly as I can. But I do want you to know that I have heard you. I am taking notes. I am writing your concerns down. And the list goes something like this. Childcare property taxes, neighborhood parks and recreation spaces, youth hockey, mental health and criminal justice, active outdoor activities for adults like golf at Leicester and Anger, homelessness, public safety, the condition of downtown Duluth, access to housing for all income levels, the condition of our streets, snow removal, planning and zoning, permitting and inspections, giving Duluth the reputation as a good place to do business, the growing cultural divide between Duluth and our surrounding region, growing our commercial tax base, reliable utilities and reliable city services. Now the vast majority of these topics are exactly what citizens and taxpayers want from their city government. Streets, utilities, public safety, parks and libraries, housing, a welcoming business environment. That's why from the beginning, our focus has been on effective and efficient core city services and making Duluth a better partner. Why am I so passionate about Core City Services? Because they should not be front page news. In fact, when city government is effective and efficient and led well, they shouldn't make news at all. They should just work. And I am so passionate about Core City Services because when city government doesn't do these things and do them well, no one else does. Don't take my word for it. Drive around Duluth, if you're able. <laughs> I am also passionate about an effective city government
that meets basic citizen and taxpayer expectations because when we fail to do these things well, city government is not trusted by residents of our community to do anything else. What do I mean? If I had a dollar for every time someone has said to me, no more bike lanes, our campaign would be fully funded. <laughs> now, I like that part, fully funded. Please, applause for that. Um, now, to be very clear, I believe in the concept of complete streets. As a legislator, I advocated and supported that policy. I always sat on the Transportation Committee. What are complete streets? Complete streets are streets designed, built, and maintained for multiple purposes. Pedestrian, cyclists, cars. <clears throat> so when I hear no more bike lanes, I push back a little. I dig a little, I ask some questions. You know what most Duluthians are really saying? They're not saying I hate bicycles. They're not saying I dislike my neighbors who ride their bikes. What they're saying is my street is terrible. My kids didn't go to school because we couldn't plow the streets. I paid for eight days of daycare last year when my kids didn't go because the daycare didn't have water due to a water main break. Duluthians are saying, I don't agree with the current city priorities. Taxpayers are saying, until you show me that you can effectively deliver basic city services and efficiently spend the tax dollars I already give you, I don't trust you to do anything else. Trust is an issue right now. That lack of trust was definitely a factor in the park levy that failed last fall. Yes, the overall economy played a role, but most Duluth chatter I heard went something like this. Where does the money go that we already pay? I'm not seeing it, and I'm not willing to give you more until I can make that connection. Over the past eight years, before reductions in credits, the average home in Duluth which by the way is valued at $213,000. I think most of us would think that's a great deal right now. Um, that's the average value of a home in Duluth. Has nearly doubled. IC 709 accounts for 26% of our property tax bill. The city of Duluth is 27. The county is 40% and other, other taxing authorities are the remainder. That also includes the existing park levy not the one that didn't pass. If you own a home in Duluth, you've seen the sticker shock in your property tax statement. If you rent, you have seen it in the sharp increase in your monthly rent payments. Now a little preference here before we dive deep into a few issues. I like to make decisions based on data and multiple viewpoints. My leadership style is to build highly effective teams, collectively work with them to set our objectives, and then get out of their way while they do their work. From that point forward, my leadership role is to provide the necessary resources, remove obstacles, give them political cover, and hold the team and myself accountable for the outcomes. So as I talk about these issues and actions here tonight, please know, no one is more acutely aware of the information deficit than I am. One candidate is already inside the building. I am not. One candidate has 881 city employees to answer their questions. I have myself, a laptop, my copy of the city budget, and a few smart friends. So we're doing our best, uh, but just keep that context in mind. So let's start by talking a little bit about the budget. Like I said, here's a copy. I don't know how many of you have actually read all 474 pages of the city budget, but I have. And I've even taken the opportunity to meet with a few experienced and knowledgeable people who know the city budget well. And we not only looked at the 2023 budget, we also compared it to a sampling of past budgets to see trend lines. Trend lines over the, the past few years. So just some numbers for comparison as we start out. In 2016, the general fund was $80 million. 
It's now $103 million. In 2016, we had 862 city employees. We now have 881. In 2016, the general property tax levy, so for those of you who, who feel like my property taxes have doubled, let's do this math. In 2016, the general levy was $24.2 million. After a 7.9% increase last fall, it's 43.6 million, 2016 to 2023. Now, I'm not, applying to val I'm not applying values to that. I'm just sharing it with you at the top so that we have some common numbers and share data and information as we have this conversation. Now, let's discuss a few of your most pressing issues. Number one, snow removal. We have talked about this and talked about this, and we're gonna talk about it again tonight. So to Jackie in Lakeside, who is interested in a mayor who will prioritize snow removal so buses can pick kids up from school, and workers who can't Zoom from home can get to work, I am with you. In a city that gets winter six months out of the year, and maybe more this year, there is no more critical core city service. And it's one that should just work. I like to get my hands dirty. It's one of the great things about local government. I like to get as close to the problem or the service as I can. I like to sit with the people who actually do the work and ask, what's going well? What's not? What should we be doing? And what should we stop doing? They know. And they know in a way that you and I never will. In the Navy, we call that leading from the front. Now we kicked off this winter with a bang. We had a big December storm that dumped around 20 inches depending on where you lived in our 26 mile long city. Now our memories can be short, but I bet you're with me on this. That was tough. That was a, that was a tough period in December. And cleanup took too long. I've got some runner friends in the room. A group of us like to do a Christmas lights run through Piedmont Heights and wow. Uh, you all had a tough situation. You were trying to remove heavy, wet snow that had sat for a couple days and now effectively was concrete. So as we ran around and offered a few heartfelt <coughs> Merry Christmases to everyone, uh, I'm very appreciative to the, to the kudos and good hearts and warm spirits that were offered in return because you were taking on a tough task. But let's be honest, in many ways, We've lived with the remnants of that December storm all winter long. Now at the start of December in 2019, we had something very similar. We had an early winter storm full of heavy wet snow that dropped around 20 inches depending on where you lived in Duluth. Back then, what we heard from city leadership in the after aftermath of that storm was this. As a city, we have let you down in our response to this storm. We take responsibility. We can do better, Duluth deserves better. We have pockets of our city left untouched and it's embarrassing. And it is not in keeping with the basic expectations every resident deserves to have. We have not done our part to fulfill your expectations in these areas. And we apologize to all of you for this. I agree completely. In 2019, students get, didn't go to Lowell and Myers-Wilkins because of snow removal issues. Leadership at that time said this neighborhood and these schools need us to show up in the biggest way, not as an afterthought. Again, I agree completely. Fast forward three years, and this is what we heard last December in the aftermath of a very similar, pretty serious storm. Nothing. The problem isn't a failure to deliver a core city service. I have sat with the women and men who plow and maintain our streets. They live in our community. They drive on our roads. The issue isn't a lack of effort or long hours of hard work on their part. And the problem isn't a leader taking responsibility, apologizing, and pledging to do better. I will say tonight, I will screw up. I will make mistakes. I will also own that and I will tell you that. Now the problem is 
not actually doing better. That's why our campaign theme, expect more, do better. In December 2022, no student in the Harbor Highlands area went to school because their neighborhood had not been plowed. Two weeks ago, parents, you may remember, no student in all of ISD 709 went to school because we couldn't clear the streets in time. So how do we do better? The, fr the step, friends, the steps here aren't rocket science. Number one, communication, consistent, timely, early, frequent. Number two, adequate staffing and resources. Right now, if one person doesn't show, they're injured, they're sick, they're on a scheduled vacation and can't cancel it and, and get back in time, we leave an entire section, section of the city unplowed. And when everyone else is done with the part they're working on, they all converge on that section and, and try to knock it out. Adequate staffing and resources also means the ability to assist with clearing sidewalks on our busiest streets. This is something that we used to do and residents are begging for help. We have 35 people that clear our streets. In the 1990s, that number was 54. Meanwhile, in the past 30 plus years, we've added approximately 20% more street miles within our city infrastructure. That math simply does not work. And we see it every winter. Another thing we need to do is embrace technology. GPS in our plows so you know where they have been. We had a conversation just before we started about, I think uh, I live on the hillside. My, one of my frustrations too, getting my driveway cleared and, and then I get the berm that's up to my chest, right? But you know, if I knew they were in the neighborhood, I'd probably just wait uh, until they got their part done and then I'd go out and do mine. An app like the city of Superior has, they rolled one out about a month ago. It is amazing. It is fabulous. It is user friendly. It gives you so much information, not just on city services, but on what is happening in the, in the city of Superior. Now, I am thrilled for our neighboring communities when they're doing well. Them doing well is also us doing well. But I'm also, my Duluth pride is a little hurt that we're not leading the way on some of these things. So, as your mayor, we will have an app. We will have GPS in our plows. We will leverage technology so that we can partner with our snow removal crews. And Duluth, please hear me now. If you ask me to serve as your mayor and we get a storm like the one we had in December or the one that we had just two weekends ago, we will declare a snow emergency. That is what that tool is there for. Not after the fact, but at the start. It is not a snow removal emergency, it is a snow emergency. We will do it before the start if the forecast is that reliable. Early is better for our crews, early is better for us as residents. And I would much rather cancel a snow emergency because we didn't end up meeting it than asking you to move your cars to the other side of the street in the middle of the storm. This is what we had two weeks ago. Now as of today, we've had 125 inches of snow. I just checked this this morning making this winter the sixth snowiest winter on record. For those of you that are going for the record, I'm not with you, I'm okay with what we have. <laughs> Top 10's fine. Um, and yet we didn't use the snow emergency once. In, in fact, not once. It's a practical tool used by nearly every one of our Northland neighbors, nearly every major city in the state of Minnesota, a tool meant to engage us as partners with our plow drivers. When we get cars off the streets, they can plow curb to curb efficiently and effectively and get it done faster. I mean, we've seen, right? You drive the streets and cars aren't moved. I mean, you're part like I'm frustrated by the condition of the road and hopefully part you're like, oh my gosh, I would never want to drive a plow. Um, that's got to be one of the toughest jobs in the middle of a storm at night with, with cars on the streets. But I just asked this question, my friends, if we're not going to use a snow emergency in a year like this one, why have it? Why did we spend thousands of tax dollars to put up the signs and the labor to put up the signs and the print and postage to mail this out at the start of the winter 
and the start of last winter if we're not going to use it in a winter like this one. And as we leave this topic, another promise I will make you is that you will never, ever find me out of town engaged in a political activity when my city is being hammered by a major snowstorm. You know where you'll find me? In a plow. <laughs> and if they won't, for good reason, let me drive a snow plow. Tom, if you, like, maybe you'll help me out here. If they won't let me drive a snow plow, I will be in a city of Duluth truck with a shovel in hand. That is leading from the front. So as we transition out of winter to spring, let's transition from snow removal to streets. To Ashley in West Duluth, who is interested in a mayor who will recognize that the condition of Duluth streets is awful. Thanks for inviting me to your home to show me your street. To see the old trolley tracks buried long ago that have now resurfaced because there is no more surface. I am with you. Decent streets are a core city service. You expect more and we can do better. Whenever spring finally arrives, we will be all be more focused on the condition of our streets. And maybe it's like, maybe it's right now, right? Just driving here, um, <laughs> thought about this part of the speech. It's a problem that we confront countless times every day. And many of us struggle to recall a time when the streets were in as bad a shape as they are right now. Yes, it's been an especially difficult winter, but an even more critical component is a lack of staffing and a lack of resources. And not saying to our community that quality streets is a top city priority. Well, I'm saying to you right now, quality streets is a core city service and will be a top Reiner administration priority. Man, I thought there'd be applause for that. <laughs> If you're not already following us on social media, I invite you to start. We're on all the platforms because I have amazing people who are helping us out. At Roger for Duluth is the handle for everything. For those of you that already are, you may have noticed that a couple weeks ago before the big storm, I swung down to the tool house. I bought some Johnson's Bakery. To be clear, I need no excuse to buy Johnson's Bakery, but I bought Johnson's Bakery. I took it down um, just to say thank you. And I want to be really clear, there was no like secret invitation here. That is something that any one of us can do. Please do. It's an awesome way, Treats is an awesome way to say thank you to those folks for long and stressful hours that they put in while many of us hunker down and ride out the worst of a storm. But what I found is that if you bring some donuts, you ask a few questions, and then you're willing to stop talking and just listen, you will learn a lot. Again, in the 1990s, we had 54 street maintenance staff. Today we have 35. Those 35 are stretched so thin that they are constantly in crisis response mode. They are not able to do the serious work of preventative maintenance. An example, like if you're a, if you're a texture like I am, this is where you insert the mind blown emoji. We have a stockpile of tar snakes crack sealant with the tissue on top. It has not been used in three years. And water is the enemy of good streets. Why? They don't have enough staff to move from crisis mode to preventative maintenance. So yes, we have the half percent sales tax dedicated to streets. I was actually the Senate author of that sales tax, championed it. Um, as a way for us to get ahead on street issues. And yes, we used to do approximately three miles of streets each year, and now we're doing 17. I think I heard last night that was 850% improvement. It is definitely progress. And yes, we are doing more new miles, but at the same time, the bad miles are becoming terrible miles because we're not able to do routine maintenance. We don't have the staff, we don't have the capacity. And too many of these new miles are actually future work in the waiting. 
A couple weeks ago, I was at a public open house meeting on another project, and I had a fascinating conversation with a Duluth resident who is also a civil engineer. We talked, I'm a geek. We talked streets, we talked street maintenance, we talked water, we talked snow removal. My biggest takeaway, she told me that unless you completely rebuild the street, including the foundation, including proper drainage, you're really only putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Reuse existing fill, that street's not gonna last as long. Don't properly drain water away from the roadbed, it's not gonna last as long. Don't fix the utilities underneath while you're at it, not gonna last as long. Only do a mill and overlay, that's where we just chew off the top few inches and, and uh, put it back down, really not going to last as long. Duluth, we have to do better. Remember my comments about bike lanes? When residents see a core city service like drivable streets continue to get worse, they question why. They question where their tax dollars are being spent, and they question city priorities, and we lose their trust. So how do we do better? Again, some practical and tangible steps. First, better communication better information. Now you've probably never done this, but I encourage you to check out the city of Buffalo, New York. They have a great street maintenance webpage. The address is pretty straightforward, buffalony.gov backslash street resurfacing. Compare it to ours. What I like about Buffalo is that it's a pretty comparable city. Similar age, also on a great lake, they also get pummeled in the winter with massive storms, and they are also a post-industrial city with aging infrastructure. So when you go to their webpage, what will you find? You'll find the current year resurfacing schedule, something you probably would expect to find, but you will also find maps. You'll find what was done last year. You'll find what's being done this year. You'll find which roads are maintained by the city, by the county, by the state, by the feds. You'll also find a one to 10 rating system with 10 being excellent and one being very poor. That information is critical. It's critical for all of us as we make community decisions about our collective priorities. And I, I had to laugh. Um, when Ashley invited me to come to her house and look at her street, I pulled up and I just said, I know you think your street is bad. It's actually not that bad compared to a lot of other Duluth streets. Like, let me show you mine. Some, there are friends in the room that have been to my house. My street is not good and, I, and I'm on a hillside. But that lack of information makes us all feel like our street is the worst street. We don't have context to put into what's being done, what are the priorities, and how are we, which ones do we maintain, which ones do other agencies work on. Again, resources. In 2019, we did 17 miles of street improvement. In 2022, we did 16.8. Now we maintain over 450 miles of road within city limits. So 17 miles is 3%. 3% of our street inventory each year. 3% each year. Do the math. That doesn't work. And we're doing that work with less staff than we had in the 1990s and 20% more street miles. If we want to get ahead of the curve, it starts with putting more staff into street maintenance so they can do more than just be reactionary. As your mayor, I will add 10 additional snow removal and street maintenance staff. 10. Is it magic? No. But it's 30% more than we have now and it's a start. And it is doable within existing staffing and existing budget. Here again, I will lead from the front. In 2016, the mayor's office had three staff and a budget of approximately $438,000. Today, that staff has doubled to six. And the budget has nearly doubled to $824,000. An average street maintenance salary is roughly $52,000. Now, fourth floor jobs in City Hall pay fairly well. 
So reducing the mayor's staff back to 2016 levels means hiring roughly five more folks into street maintenance. Halfway to my goal, great starting point. But we also have to look at additional funding. We received $58 million in ARPA funds, part of federal recovery during the pandemic. Of that, some 24 million remains unallocated. These funds are being used elsewhere for street repair. In Bowling Green, Ohio, they proposed a massive one-time boost in paving money from their ARPA funds, allocating nearly half of what they had. The mayor there said, and I quote, a fundamental expectation of local governments is repair and maintenance of the city's roads. Over the next three years in Bowling Green, that funding will more than double the street paving the city could normally afford. We also have over 30 million in our community investment trust. Now back in my city council days, those were the funds we dedicated for Duluth street improvements. Additionally, we have the dedicated half-cent sales tax, which brought in about $6 million last year, and a 1% unrestricted general sales tax, which brought in about $15 million last year. Now, I recognize there are competing demands for all of these resources, but if we want to do better, the resources are there. We can't say there's no money. We can't say we're doing the best we can. We have to say, as a community, that better streets are a core city service and they need to be a priority. Now lastly, before we leave this topic, a new library would be amazing. Honestly, many new things without our community would be amazing. But I argue it's not our community's top priority right now. And if we can unlock 40 million in state and federal funds for anything, it should be our streets and utilities. The current, <laughs> the current politics at the state capitol combined with a record budget surplus present the perfect opportunity for Minnesota's regional centers along with Minneapolis and St. Paul to present a united lobbying front to our state government for a generational investment in our municipal infrastructure. We cannot let this opportunity pass. Oh, just a sneak peek. Next week, we're going to invite you to nominate your terrible pothole. I know this is a bit like therapeutic and, and uh, a bit cathartic, but we want to identify the top three based on your submissions and then your feedback. But here's the part I get really excited about. As your mayor, I'm gonna go out with a street maintenance crew and we are gonna permanently fix those three worst that you identified. That is getting my hands dirty with the work of city government. It is what I love to do and it is leading from the front. So let's change topics and speak for a minute about housing. For Andy who told me how hard it was to buy a home after moving to Duluth, so hard that you actually gave up and then found it just as hard to find an apartment to rent, I'm with you. We need more housing opportunity at all income levels. Yes, affordable is critical. Yes, workforce housing is important, but so is market rate. And honestly, so is upper end. Why? Because when people who have the means can't find what they're looking for, they buy down. They rent down. They put pressure, downward pressure, on our existing housing stock and make it even more difficult for people with less resources to find quality housing. And unless we fix where we are stuck in market rate purchase and rental, we will never create enough affordable housing to keep up with our demand. So how do we do that? I've had multiple conversations with the people in our community who do this. They build housing. They build apartment buildings. And here is what I learned. First, we have to allocate funds for, for the removal of condemned structures. These blight our neighborhoods, 
they take up lots that already have existing utilities, lots that would otherwise be available for infill construction in our already built out neighborhoods. And to be clear, for those of you who don't know, I am in the heart of town. I am a central a West Hillside guy. Um, so these are my neighborhoods. We also need to establish a no or low interest fund for site prep and utility work. As one builder told me, I won't build in Duluth unless a client specifically demands that I do. Why? Because they usually have about $100,000 into the project from site prep and utilities before they even start building the home. Because my question to him was, why can't we get to market with market rate housing? And that was a number one issue that he pointed to. We also have to insist on a permit and inspection culture in City Hall of partnership. We desperately need new housing units. Our culture inside City Hall has to be, how do we get to yes? How do we do more? It can't be no. It cannot be the answer is no. It cannot be confusing or inconsistent answers. Even worse, it cannot be no answer. It has to be, how do we be your better partner? So now I'm gonna tackle a topic that is really difficult, and I'll be honest, it's one that I don't have all the answers for, but it is the number one issue I've heard about, and it is the number one issue I think we have to speak to, downtown and public safety. So to Nick, who works downtown and is interested in a mayor who will say that your concerns about public safety are more than just perceived, they are real, and they cannot continue, I'm with you. The condition of downtown Duluth is serious, and we are not the only ones to see that. You might have seen earlier this month, month on March 13th, the New York Times ran an article featuring Duluth, not mentioning featuring Duluth. The title was, Out of Towners Head to Climate Proof Duluth. Now mind you, the New York Times has a print circulation of about 310,000 and a digital online subscriber base of some 6.4 million. So combined, that's about 700 or 7 million potential viewers. Here is how they described downtown Duluth. City Hall sits in the heart of Duluth's now blighted downtown, where cocktail bars and co-working spaces form a checkerboard with abandoned storefronts. Duluth, this cannot be the way our city is portrayed to millions of people around the globe. If you are not offended, if your Duluth civic pride is not hurt, I am offended and hurt enough for all of us. <laughs> Downtown is the heart of a community. And much like our bodies, when our heart is ailing, nothing else will do well. And it's only a matter of time before that impacts the rest of our community. So yes, whether you live in Lakeside or Morley Heights or Kenwood or Piedmont Heights, Upper Smithville, Fond du Lac, you should care about the condition of downtown Duluth. And yes, even if you never go downtown, or more likely you now avoid going downtown, you should care about the condition of downtown Duluth. COVID has played its part, to be sure, especially with remote working and the emptying of commercial office space in favor of Zoom and working from home. But that's now three years ago. In fact, this Saturday will be the three-year anniversary of my orders to Italy to help lead a COVID crisis response team at the start of the pandemic. But lest you believe that our downtown is every downtown, I invite you to travel. And you don't need to go to Macon, Georgia. Go see another community, see another downtown. It's something I don't think we do enough. Last summer, I visited an Army friend who was at Fort McCoy in Wisconsin. Again, Army guys, Army gals, I have Army friends. Um, military humor. Okay. Um, 
And we spent an afternoon in downtown La Crosse, and it was amazing. Multiple local coffee shops, multiple ethnic restaurants, an obvious downtown residential population, residers, residents and visitors wandering the streets, clean, safe, easy to navigate. Oh, and for those of you who haven't been to La Crosse before, the Pearl Ice Cream Palace, must stop, must stop. Ice cream and donuts, always the easy win for me. Now, I had never been to La Crosse before, and I was impressed. I imagined it being comparable in size to Duluth. It certainly felt like it. It's not. With a population of 52,000, it's just over half our size. And more, it's downtown does not have Lake Superior sitting on its doorstep. According to the map, the Mississippi River was over yonder, but all I could see was a line of trees that probably indicated the shoreline. And yet right now, their downtown is kicking our butt. We cannot say that this is good enough or that we are doing our best. So how do we do better? Number one, first, we have to admit that public safety is an issue and that group walks and street art is not the solution. Yes, we want to activate space, meaning we want people downtown. We want people that are doing positive and productive things. But until we address perceived and real public safety experiences, many Duluthians and our visitors from throughout the region and across Minnesota are simply reluctant to explore our downtown. And serious crime is more than just a perception. It is real. I know the calls for service have dropped, and I know we have law enforcement in the room, but I can tell you that many of you who work downtown have told me you've just stopped calling. It hasn't gotten better. You're just not asking the police to respond to as many things. And here are just a few actual examples. Not long after we launched our campaign, I ran into a couple where the husband was shot. And I was like, what? Yeah. Shot walking home back up the hillside from Fourth Fest in Bayfront. We read about and heard about the downtown library employee who was punched in the face last winter after, attack, after asking an individual to put their mask back on. Our librarians didn't sign up for that. Last summer, a clean and safe team member was brutally attacked and beaten by an individual who had done the same thing three months earlier. The comment then from downtown Duluth leadership was, it's time for zero tolerance. Our downtown deserves better. Our community deserves better. Now, we cannot arrest our way to a safer downtown. It is not the humane approach. And frankly, it is not the cost-effective one. Instead, we have to do a better job connecting individuals struggling with homelessness, mental health, and substance addiction issues to recovery and supportive services. And I approach this with a couple guiding principles that are very near and dear to me. First, it is not a crime to be homeless. It is not a crime to suffer from mental illness. It is not a crime to suffer under the weight of addiction. Living on the street, in a tent, or under the freeway is not the healthy or humane thing for any individual in our community, nor is it the healthy thing for our downtown or our Duluth neighborhoods. Now, to a point I heard made last night, yes, panhandling is free speech, but it's not an excuse to not do better. Now, I'm gonna get lawyerly for a minute, a law that specifically bans asking for money in traditionally public forums like sidewalks and parks does likely violate the constitutional right to free speech because that restriction is based on content. But that doesn't mean that we don't have the opportunity to look at things like time and place. Further, public urination, public defecation, public intoxication, harassment, vandalism, graffiti, dealing drugs, using drugs, 
robbery, assault, battery. These all remain enforceable crimes. Now what I didn't hear last night, and I wanna say clearly tonight, to my friends in public safety, to Duluth Fire and Duluth Police, I support you. I thank you. You go out and do a job every day that we all want done. And none of us want to do it ourselves. I will hold myself accountable and I will hold each of you accountable for our collective oath to the public. But I will always have your back. And I will support And I will support you in your work to keep our community safe. And we have fire here tonight, and we have police here tonight, and I found out that I have a former student here tonight who is looking to be in law enforcement. So just give those folks a round of applause. Like, they're so appreciative. But let's be clear. Our goal here is not to arrest and prosecute every potential offender. I've had many law enforcement conversations and have learned that approximately 20 individuals cause 90% of the real issues. Arrest, prosecute, work the court system and the criminal justice system for long-term prevention of those repeat offenders. But for the remainder, the vast majority of the people that we encounter, while we need to be willing to say this behavior in this place is not okay, we also need to do more to provide safe places where people can be fed, people can be counseled, people can be supported. And here is what will be different. Saying no when one of those other offenses is involved is not an option. These individual choices have real public safety and economic costs for our community. And tonight I also want to share that I think it's critical we look for more permanent intermediary housing, intermediary housing for individuals struggling with meth and opioid addictions. When I ran, yes, please. When I ran for city council in 2005, the hot button issue at that time was the San Marco. It was the controversial issue of the day. I was a supporter, my opponent was opposed, and I was a supporter because the women and men of Duluth Police and involved in our district court system told me San Marco is the better solution. The better solution than a revolving door at the detox center. The better solution than picking up the same person every day. The better solution than filling up the court system in our county jail. And for the record, time has shown that they're correct. What is, compar what is the comparable supported li supportive living model for the portion of our community that is struggling with addiction? Where can they be shown recovery and next steps on a path up and out? Where can they be supported if they're not able to get there? I don't know, but let's make it our goal to figure that out and create that space. If you've committed a serious offense, you will have your day in court. But if you're just trying to get through life and you've made an unhealthy choice, we have to have a better option than a tent or living on the street. Now, final component of downtown is a sizable, thriving, visible downtown residential population. We already have some, we have some downtown rental, we have HRA residential units in the near hillside. We have some upper end condos on Superior Street. We need more, especially market rate rental and condo purchase opportunities. Young professionals, empty nesters, and wherever me and Leo, Leo's my dog by the way if you don't know, <laughs> wherever me and Leo fit, we're exactly who you want living downtown. Bringing energy, activity, retail, and investment to our downtown. And their presence will help curb less productive behaviors. 
downtown commercial commercial space utilization is at, is at about 50% of what it was prior to the pandemic. And that's actually up over the last couple of years. But let's be honest, the reality is it's not likely to ever be what it was pre-pandemic. Hybrid work and virtual work are here to stay for many professionals. Let's make it a Duluth priority to turn excess commercial space into downtown residential space. And like the federal government did when bringing a viable COVID vaccine to market, let's warp speed this. Not five or 10 years from now, let's have a viable downtown residential population next year or the year after. Duluth, let's get after it. The last big topic I'm gonna to touch on, and, and then I've got a couple one-offs for some special audiences that I know are here, our city hall culture. To Courtney, I hope, I, I didn't see her, so I hope she's out there listening tonight, who told me how her husband built her a desk so she could work out of the back of her pickup truck at a in a gas station parking lot during the middle of COVID and continue to provide critical services to the rest of us. I am with you. I applaud you. It is so easy to be negative about public employees. And I want Duluthians to know Courtney's commitment and the commitment of so many who make a conscious choice to work as public employees for the city of Duluth. One of the major themes we have had is making City Hall a better partner to residents, to events, to existing and new businesses. And my friends, it is sad for me to say tonight that I have to add to that list a better partner to our city employees. This could go without saying, but I want all of you to hear me say it. There is no city without city workers. Thank you. You could do other things, and you would likely make more money doing it. As a potential future coworker, I am proud of you. I appreciate you. I thank you. That's a round of applause right there, please. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to meet with the bargaining units that represent the city of Duluth, and I have heard a consistent and troubling theme. Lack of respect, lack of support, too much management, not enough resources, not enough people providing the frontline services that we all really want as taxpayers. Some of you may be familiar with the website Glassdoor. It's an employer review website, a place where employees can provide information about their employers and give potential job seekers some straight from the source insights, reviews, and inside intel. I invite you to Google City of Duluth. It is sobering. 2.7 out of a five star rating. 30% would recommend the city as a good place to work. 12% think city leadership is doing a good job. This post that I pulled directly from the website is reflective of too many conversations I've had with our current and former city employees. The title of the post, this place is a dumpster fire. <laughs> Pros, the benefits are good for now. Time off is ample, and I love, I love, genuinely love this. The coworkers are exceptional and dedicated. Now the cons. Administration treats employees like liabilities. Morale is extremely low. The administration attempts to restrict the freedom of employees and treats them like children. There is a significant us versus them mentality between union and administration. The administration cares more about looking good in the public's eye rather than actually taking care of its employees. Advice to management, management needs to pay, management needs to pay employees a market rate in order to hire and retain quality workers. And management needs to trust that employees will do their jobs and stop micromanaging. In one of the meetings I had, 
an employee said, if you have an idea and I come to the table with a different idea, is that okay? And I literally, like I had a blank stare. Like it took me a minute. I'm like, yeah, you know your job better than I do. Please do. Like I am not the smartest guy in the room. I count on you coming to the table with your good ideas. It doesn't mean we're not gonna tussle it up. It doesn't mean we're not gonna have some conversation about the, the way to move forward. And it doesn't mean at the end of the day, I, I don't have to make that call, but we are a team. Now Duluth, why should we care? Because these are the very people who day in and day out provide the city services that we most want as a result of our tax dollars. And we need more of them. And we all know post pandemic, we remain in a hyper competitive hiring environment. We're a public employer and we will likely never top the salary scale. My hope is that with good benefits, great coworkers, and a place you love to work combined with your heart for the public good, we should have a workforce that we need for Duluth's next chapter. Clearly, we have work to do to get there. So now let me just, uh, as we get to the end of my comments tonight, give you a quick touch on a couple other topics that I've already spoken to, but I know we have some folks here tonight that are interested in hearing me touch on these. So the first one is, gosh, we need Duluth to have a reputation as a great place to do business. Why? Yes, yes, this is what you think it. Because Duluth businesses pay commercial property taxes. And commercial, commercial property tax in Minnesota foots most of our local property tax bill. So when we don't grow our commercial property tax base, that burden shifts to residential. It shifts to homeowners. And we've seen the shift. We have felt the shift. In 2023, the current administration proposed a nearly 9% property tax increase. Now that got cut down a little to 7.9, but still significant. At the same time, we were all living with nearly 9% inflation. In 2021, the average income in Duluth was $34,000, and the average household income was $58,000. Duluth, we know this is not sustainable. Yet we want quality services and costs continue to rise. So what is the answer? The answer is grow our commercial tax base. Work hard to give Duluth a reputation as a great place to do business. Now I've talked with countless large business owners, small business owners, property developers. Never once have they said it's about um, our uh, construction trades in Duluth. Never once, literally, have they said, oh, you have project labor agreements, we don't wanna do business in Duluth. Nope. They've had one consistent theme. It is incredibly hard working with the city of Duluth. They have said it is being told no. It is being given inconsistent and conflicting information. And in far too many cases, it is being told nothing. That has to change. It is not my job to judge your project. It is not my job to assign social value to what you are trying to do. We have zoning, we have code. Those are reflections of our community norms. Those are community fences that we need to protect. But inside those fences is a big pile of yes. My job and the job of every city hall staff person is to be your partner in getting to yes. Let's make things happen. Let's move projects forwards. Let's develop our commercial tax base. Let's give Duluth the reputation as a good place to do business. Now I know I've got some friends in the room who are involved in our hospitality industry and I want you to hear me say tonight that I strongly disagree with the decision that was made to dismantle our marquee destination marketing organization, Visit Duluth, and instead hire a PR firm from Edina. <laughs> a 
a PR firm from Edina and an ad agency from South Dakota. Duluth dollars. The market data also indicates that this was not a decision beneficial to Duluth. Yes, tourism taxes are up. I heard that last night. But that's because prices have increased. A percentage of more is more. However, occupancy is actually down. And that should be concerning to us all. Less visitors means less business. Less visitors also means less opportunity to tell a positive Duluth story to our state and our region. Tourism, my friends, is a big deal for us, a really big deal. Not only is it a significant sector of our regional Duluth economy, but the related marketing helps shape how others see us. I can tell you firsthand the reality of Duluth being a popular <coughs> tourist destination. It made my job of selling Duluth at the state capitol that much easier. If you came down to see me, you know this. Every year I was in the legislature, right outside my door, I had a Visit Duluth card rack. Did I want people to visit our community, to stay, to eat, to spend money? Absolutely. Even more, I wanted to remind them that they likely already had. It's a lot easier to discuss sanitary sewer overflows, improvements at our zoo, redoing the Blotnick Bridge, or expanding the Duluth Airport when decision makers can picture your community and have a warm fuzzy about having visited it. So it was disappointing to see the administration select a non-Duluth-based firm. It is hard to tell an authentic Duluth story when you are not from here and actually not authentically Duluth. We need to change that. <laughs> Lastly, for my golfer friends, Lester Park Golf Course will not remain closed if I'm your next mayor. <laughs> the current administra administration called this decision necessary. I disagree. First, much of the data cited for this necessary decision came from 2019, pre-COVID. We know COVID turned the world upside down for many, and it also really changed the way we live our daily lives. One of those changes was a renewed interest in outdoor activities. And I just, small aside, right? I'm over in Italy during the spring and like uh, quarantine there was real, and we're all watching you all back home outside, getting after it, and, like, and it, we were just like, oh wow, that is, that is not the experience we're having right now. It was an interesting contrast. But being outside, hiking, camping, canoeing, golf, these are great activities. National data actually indicates, bad pun, golf is on the upswing. And there are more golfers teeing it up for the first time now than there were post-pandemic, pre-pandemic. Second, as a community, we just need more opportunities for residents to be outdoors, to be ha active, to, be, to enjoy healthier lifestyles. That's good for the individual. It is good for our community health. As a city, we don't need to be either or about our beloved outdoor activities. It's not trails versus golf courses. It's not traditional community parks versus other activities. It is both and. It is all of the above. We know that there are active and interested Duluth residents who want to find a way to make our golf courses work, to make our golf courses economically sustainable, and to find the necessary capital investments. As your mayor, I'm going to invite you back to the table so we can figure that out. One of my top priorities if asked to serve as your mayor is to see the city do a better job of being a good partner. The decision to close Lester, despite alternatives that were worth exploring, is a classic example of an opportunity to expect more and for us to do better. I'm excited about working with you on figuring out what those solutions might look like. So, in, as we hit the conclusion part, and I'm so appreciative of everyone being here tonight, buckling up for a, for a little bit of a longer talk. I don't wanna to leave tonight without, a, without calling your attention to a critical opportunity that has not happened in at least a generation, if not more. 
in addition to mayor being on the ballot in November, we will have six city council seats. It's usually four or five, depending on the cycle. But with the passing of my dear friend, Renee Van Nett, the fourth district seat will also be on the November ballot. Now for too many cycles, we have lacked robust competition for mayor and also for our city council races. Four current councilors have already indicated they will not be running. I thank Gary Anderson, Hannah Alstead, Eric Forsman and Noah Hobbs for their service. Duluth, if you expect more, yes, please. This is my sixth campaign. I always say it's something everyone should do, and I know why not most of you never will. <laughs> um, so I, I really do appreciate those who step forward. But Duluth, if you expect more from your tax dollars and our city services, and you believe, this, believe the city of Duluth can do better, 2023 is your chance. Do not miss it. In one election year, you as a voter will have more opportunity to change the direction of this city than any voter has had in years. Yes, support me, help me, work with me, make a donation. But also go find council candidates who reflect your interest and priorities, with whom I can work as mayor to get things done. Support them, help them, work for them, donate to them. Recruit them if you have to. Be one of them if no one else is stepping forward. Now I'm well aware that this, is, this uh, talk tonight is too much for some and not enough for others. That my Stockdale paradox approach might be a little bit too much reality. But we have to be willing to confront our present circumstances while never ever losing belief in the Duluth we will be. And again, my friends, I am not naive. I served five years on the city council. I served eight in the legislature. I have seen the process and the players up close. I know that doing better will be hard, especially the first year as we realign priorities and get the right leadership team in place to move those priorities forward. And I will inherit a 2024 budget, not just set by someone else, but by another candidate for this office. But let me close by leaving you with this promise. Duluth, I do hard things. I did a workshop for the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce back in December titled The Gift of Crisis Leadership. One of the statements I made in that presentation was that the most challenging work I have done, the most significant growth I have had as a leader, is after I left elected office in 2016. A combat tour in Afghanistan, a deployment to Italy at the start of the pan a global pandemic, leading the deck for a year during the darkest days of COVID and ensuring its survival. Duluth, together, we will do hard things. To paraphrase John Kennedy, when he famously called Americans to join him in our effort to reach the moon, we choose to do better because we know it is right to expect more from ourselves and the community that we love. We choose to roll up our sleeves, to lock arms with our neighbors, and to get busy getting after it. Not because it will be easy, but because we know it will be hard. And because these goals will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because the challenge is one that we are willing to accept. And the challenge is also one which we are unwilling to postpone. My friends, my fellow Duluthians, these challenges cannot be postponed. The state of our city is serious. And according to my watch, the time is now. Thank you. So again, please hang out. That's the, the end of the official part. 
I'll do some stuff with the media if they want it, but I, I, I'm going to get rid of the jacket and tie, and I look forward with chatting everyone who's willing, willing to stay. Thank you. And I would be remiss in not doing my job if I didn't ask you to do one thing. Um, thank you all for coming. And if you liked what you heard tonight, and you and something spoke to you with Roger's message, the committee asks you to support Roger. Um, to support him by going to our website, rogerforduluth.com. There are QR codes around the room. There are envelopes around the room. We ask you to either sign up on the website, to volunteer, to sign up for a lawn sign, or to make a donation to support the campaign. We will need your support to get this across the finish line in November. Thank you very much for your support tonight.